our Father, we come tonight just to declare that it is our pleasure just to worship you. It's our pleasure just to glorify you. It's our pleasure just to honor you. It is our pleasure just to be in your presence. In the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. And the joy of the Lord is a strength unto God's people. We worship and we bless you. We worship and we bless you. We worship and we bless you. Oh, be thou glorified, O Lord, in all the earth. Be thou glorified in all the earth. We just magnify you, Lord. We thank you, God. We thank you, God. We thank you for your presence that is in this place. We thank you, God, for your anointing that is able to break every yoke of bondage. That we declare that you have come to set the captives free. You have come, O oh God, that we may have life and have it more abundantly. You have come, O oh God, that we will have the Zoe life, this life of God. So we declare over every life, over every person that is joining us in this house and online, in the name of Jesus, may the life of God, may the power of God, may the breath of God breathe on them, Lord Jesus. Just another breath, just another breath, anointing for a new season, an anointing of God and a refreshing in the mighty name of Jesus. So we declare today, we declare that this is the day that you have made. We will rejoice and we will be glad in it. We thank you that you said you sent forth your word and you healed all of our sicknesses. Heal all of our diseases. And so we know that everything that has a name has to bow to the name of Jesus. We declare divine healing. We declare divine prosperity. We, de we declare divine provisions. We declare divine assignments are being unleashed in this season. Just move by your spirit. Move by your spirit, Lord. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. And Amen. 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 Thank you to the worship team. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. You may be seated. Bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. It's good to be home. Amen. Amen. I'm glad to be home. Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, would you turn with me to the book of Philippians? Read a few verses of scripture. Philippians chapter 2. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, the last two weeks I was busy. I'll give you more feedback from it on the weekend. Amen. The Lord has been faithful. Amen. Hallelujah. You see, you see the hand of the Lord in unusual ways. You see in just the hand of the Lord. So thank you for your prayers your support in ensuring that the work of God that we can continue doing the work of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Bless the Lord. So in Philippians chapter 2 verses 12, it says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purposes. Amen? Amen. Paul, writing to the church at Philippi, makes a statement and he starts off by saying, as you have always obeyed, and he looked at it and he goes and qualifies it, he says, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence. Amen. I pray that we would get into the place of maturity as the body of Christ and as the church of God, that we do not have to be super, supervised in our salvation. And that means we do not behave just because somebody is watching or maybe somebody is seeing. Amen. That means we understand how to behave as a, as a child of God, irrespective of the season and irrespective of whether someone's watching or not watching. Amen. So he says, uh, you have obeyed not 
only in my presence, but also much more in my absence. And then he, called, he, he speaks about continue to work out your salvation. Say to your neighbor, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now this is a very important part. All of us have an important assignment from the Lord that we have to work out our own salvation. Amen. That means I cannot work out my salvation for my wife. I cannot work it out for my child. I cannot work it out for my friend, my neighbor, my brother, my sister, my parents. I cannot work out their salvation. I have to work out my salvation. Amen. That means somebody has to take responsibility for their own selves. Amen. Yeah. And so when we understand this, there is a shift a little bit in our in our perspective because we've often seen church as taking responsibility for our salvation. The pastor is taking responsibility for our salvation. But in this season, we're going to have to take responsibility for our own season. And, uh, our own salvation, sorry. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. So this, this evening, may the Lord work in you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. To do, to will and to act and to fulfill his good purpose. Amen. That's important. You know, so many times we are working out our own things. We are trying to work out what we, what we desire, what we will. But are we working on the place where God is working on us to perform his will? His purpose in our life. Amen? Amen. Because if we get to understand His purpose, then we will begin to be more at rest in our life. Yeah. But I like verses 14. And this is where I'm going to depart tonight. It says, do everything without grumbling or arguing. Yeah. So that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a walk and in a crooked generation. Then you will shine amongst them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. Look at it. How would you shine? When you hold firmly to the word of God. How are you going to overcome the world? When you hold firmly to the word of God. Then I will be, a then I will be able to boast on that day of Christ that I did not run for labor in vain. But if I am being poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice, the service coming from your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. So you too will be glad and rejoice with me. Amen. Amen. Today I want to speak about no complaint. Amen. Now I remove all excuses. Amen. And I've got a scripture for you. Philippians 2.14 Do everything without grumbling and without arguing. The King James says it like this. Do everything without complaining. Without murmuring and disputing. Amen. And without complaining. Say no complaining. No complaining. Amen. Now, every now and again, we like to complain. Some of us more than others. Some people, when they phone you, you don't want to pick up the phone. Because you know, as they start, they're just only complaining. They never ever have good news. They always have a problem. Some people thrive on a problem. There's no problem. They are restless. So they go and find a problem so that they can inform you that something is happening. So somebody says, no complaint. No complaint. You know, sometimes when you look at our lives and we look at, sometimes we've got so much of reason and you feel like we've got a lot of reason to complain. But when we look at the lives of others around us, we sometimes begin to realize, I really don't have a reason. Or what I thought was my reason or, or a valid reason to be complaining is not so valid when I look at how worse off somebody else is doing. How the challenges are greater, but they're still keeping their head up and they're still living. Now, I want you to understand as a child of God, 
We should do everything without complaint. We should do the will of the Lord, not because it is comfortable for us. We should live in the will of the Lord, not because it is easy for us. We should live in the will of the Lord, not when everything is going well for us. Yeah. Yeah. We should live in the will of the Lord just because I am in the will of the Lord. Amen. 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 Now, sometimes it may feel like, and we've often taught it, that when you are in the will of the Lord, when you only feel the peace of God. Amen. How many of you know there were several occasions Jesus is with his disciples, and his disciples are in the will of the Lord. Remember the one, the one occasion they are crossing the the the, 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 the sea of Galilee, and in the middle of the sea of Galilee, a storm arose in the middle of the transition. Remember, Jesus said to them, we have to go on to the other side, right? The instruction was, we're going on the other side. That means if I interpret it, according to the word, it is they are in the will of the Lord as they transition from one side to the other side. What happens in the middle doesn't now change the will of the Lord. Yeah, 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 yeah. Amen. Because sometimes, we are in the will of the Lord, and yet there are troubles on every side. There are shakings on every side, but you are in the will of the Lord. And it is possible that we can respond like the, like the disciples when they responded to Jesus and they said, Don't you care that we perish? They forgot for a moment what he said. We've got to cross on to the other side. He didn't say, I've got to cross on to the other side. He said, we got to cross on to the other side. That means we included everyone that was on the boat was going to make it. If you've got a word from the Lord, if you've got a promise from the Lord, you've got to understand that that promise will be fulfilled. No matter what takes place, whatever the interruption. Yeah. Whatever the, 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 the circumstance that arises doesn't change the destination, yeah. doesn't change the purpose, yeah. doesn't change the will of the Lord. Yeah. We sometimes change the will of the Lord because we are in uncomfortable or uncharted territory. Yeah. But the Lord says, you are in my world. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So I want you to understand this because he, he comes and he says, do everything without grumbling or without arguing. Sometimes it feels like we've got every reason to grow. What do you do when you've been faithful? What do you do when you've been obedient? What do you do when you, you've followed every assignment of the Lord and yet things sometimes get out of your control? You still stay. You still be obedient. You still keep walking. You still keep doing. You still keep fulfilling everything that God told you to do. You don't stop because somebody said to you something is not right. You don't stop because somebody said to you it is not it, it is not good or something else has happened in your life. You've got to keep on going as long as God says to you that you keep on going. Amen. So this is important. Now I want to use, for example, today, the children of Israel in the midst of the wilderness. As they transitioning to the wilderness, we see a parallel between the children of Israel and the people today, the church of God today. Remember, Jesus is in the boat. The disciples are in the boat. The disciples come to him. He's sleeping. Sometimes, all of, uh, all of us don't have the same kind of sleeping bag. If you're like Annie, Annie wakes up at every sound. If you're like me, I'm out. I wake up if there's a need. It has to really be like an earthquake. If I'm, if I'm sound asleep, I'm sound asleep. And that is a powerful thing to happen. So, the, 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 the challenge that we find is that we they are in the boat, Jesus is asleep, they come and say to him, don't you care that we perish? 
Jesus doesn't respond to them. He doesn't say whether he cares or he doesn't care. He gets up. But the important part about it is that Jesus gets up, doesn't talk to them, goes out, speaks to the wind and to the waves, and they come. Then they say, what manner of man is this? Now they've been following him for a long time. But they're still surprised that now even the climate, even weather, the elements respond. And so he says, what manner of man is this that the winds and the waves obey you? But I want you to understand you cannot release peace until peace is inside of you. You've got to know in the very nature of Jesus Christ, he is the Prince of Peace. So when he wakes up and he speaks to the, the winds that are raging and the storm that is raging and the seas that are boisterous and he says, be peace. He's able to release peace because he is the Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. Now, if you're going to change the circumstances and the climate and the situations around you, you've got to be able to release what is on the inside of you. But if turmoil is on the inside of you and you are in a, in, in a boisterous situation or in a storm, you are not going to begin to calm it down. But you've got to allow Christ to be born in you. So that the peace that is in him now becomes evident in your life. So that whatever is going on around you is not affecting you. Amen. Now this is the important part. How can Jesus sleep in the midst of the storm? It's because he has the peace of God. To know that although the storm is raging, the storm doesn't determine how he's going to live got to make a choice today not to let the circumstances around you to determine how you're going to live. Because you, you're going to face circumstances that you have no control over, but you're going to have to determine that it's not going to control you. Amen? Now the children of Israel, they've lived in Egypt for over 400 years. All they know is Egypt. Sorry, they lived in Egypt, sorry, for 400 years. All they know is Egypt. And now there is a promise that is coming through Moses, who is a, a man of God that is bringing a promise to them that says that God has a land that he has purpose for you. A promised land. Canaan land. And the children of Israel did not Although they were wanting better, they didn't want to leave what they knew. If you're going to try and move people from what they know, as long as they, they are not convinced of where you are taking them to, they will continuously fight you all the way in the journey. Have you ever realized that you cannot help somebody who doesn't want to help themselves? No matter how much better you can, you can tell them what their future is going to be, what God is going to do through their life, but up until they get it in their spirit that where I am is not good enough, it doesn't make a difference. So I want you to get into your, into your spirit. The reason sometimes we complain in the journey is because we have never resolved that it is time for me to change. It's time for me to move. It's time for me. Sometimes it is because although you want better, and although you can see better for yourself, you have not made the shift to saying the better is for me. Amen? And this is important, whether it is a student that is at school, 
whether it's a student at university, whether it's as a couple that is building their home, or even if you are older in your life, wherever you are in your journey of life, until you begin to grab a hold of the word and say, this is my promise, this is the word of God for me, that God has said to me, I am the head and not the tail, I'm above only and not beneath, and God has got greater for me, I'm not going to make the shift. And if, if you force the person to make the shift, they will keep on complaining. They're going to say, you've made me do this. Every time something goes wrong, they're going to say, you told me to do this. Every time something doesn't work out the way that they say, you told me to do this. I was better off. Remember, this is familiar when we talk about the children of Israel. This is familiar. There were almost 14 different occasions where the children of Israel complained between leaving Egypt and coming to the river Jordan, never entering the promise, but coming to the brink of the river Jordan. It is in a, in a 40 year span, there has been 14 different occasions where they complained. The first complaint was, was in Exodus chapter 5, verse 1 to 22. I'm not going to read all the verses. But the people complained to Moses because of him and because of his talk about the promised land. And they say, because you are talking about the promised land, now Pharaoh is making things worse for us. Amen. Now this is also a challenge in our lives. That means when the enemy creates pressure in our homes, in our work, in our schools, to discourage us in the beginning of our Christian walk. This is where, this is how the children of Israel were. They were in the beginning phases of a move out of Egypt. And yet they came to Moses and, and, they, and they complained and they said, we were okay till you brought talk. How many times have some people they starting their Christian walk, or they just beginning to build their faith again, and all of a sudden things start to get a little bit uncomfortable. Amen. Yeah. You are making a step for God. You are making a, a change in your life for God, and everything that you're doing, you're doing the right things, but it seems like everything else around you is getting agitated. Yeah. Now this is the enemy trying to keep you where you are. Yeah. You've got to recognize what it is. It was the enemy trying to bring discouragement to them. Sometimes you look at it, uh, sometimes the uh, all of a sudden when you make a decision for God, all of a sudden everything else in other parts of your life doesn't work out. Whether at work, whether with friends, whether with family, people will say, oh, now you think you're better than us. Now, now people will come back and they say, oh, you, 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 now you're too holy. And, you know, and everything to distract you from continuing the moon. Remember, they didn't leave Egypt and they already started complaining. And what were they complaining about? They were complaining about him telling them it's better. This is one of the hardest things. I was talking to someone the other day and I, and, and I said to them, you cannot want good for somebody if they do not want it for themselves. Yeah. No matter how much you want it for them, until they come to a realization that this is what they need, they won't make the shift. Otherwise, you will be responsible for taking care of everything. And this is what happened to Moses. And the leadership of Moses was really burdened by the fact that he had to convince the people that didn't want to move, to move. He almost had to unsettle them. And he had to make decisions that caused them to shift. I believe in the millions of people that left Egypt, not, not even 50% of them were with Moses. Wholeheartedly. There was the other 50% that joined saying, if we don't go, we won't know. That means there's always a group of people that follow, not because they believe.
believe in the more, they follow because others are following, and in case if I don't follow, then it'll be seem like I ain't missing. But they follow saying, I'm going to watch and see. And if it fails, I'm going to say, I told you so. I want to be there to tell you that I told you so. You know, there's a lot of the people that, 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 that follow you and they say, I agree with you, I'm here, I'm here. But they just play in the numbers. Because they dare to see if it works out, I was always here. If it doesn't work out, they say, no, I wasn't a part of that. Amen. Now, this is an important. It happens all over. Whether you're in corporate, whether you're in the church, it happens whether you're in a family, even in your own home. Sometimes you have to make a decision to move forward and everybody, they, 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 they say, yeah, I'm with you, but they're really actually saying, I'm watching and praying. I'm watching and seeing what's happening here, if it's going to work out for you. Amen? The first step was when he had laid the vision before him. Amen? This is some things that we have to get used to. From the beginning, people have to make the shift. Then, in Exodus chapter 14, verse 11 and 12, the people complained and said to Moses, you should have left us alone. Now remember, they have left Egypt, and they're now facing the Red Sea. And behind them they can see Pharaoh and his soldiers are coming for them. And they come to him and say, you should have rather left us to die in Egypt. They, they even said there are no graves yet. <laughs> they saying there's, no, there's a lot of land, but they think there's no place to even dig graves yet. And I mean, they were already thinking we did. We finished. Tell us, oh yeah, you know, they are gone. Everything is there's this. The, the, the whole thing is that they complained and they said to Moses, you should have left us. This is when you are faced with what seems an impossible situation, all because you listen to the word of God. Every one of us are going to face that. When you are obedient to the word of God, sometimes impossible situations you're going to face. That impossible situation is just a distraction. That's just an interruption. It's just a question mark that is formed to begin to create doubt in your mind. You've got to remember, God gave you an assignment. You're going to remain faithful to that. Remember, they said you should have left us uh, alone. What happens when somebody leads you out of this place and you're not ready to move, the first thing you start to do is blame them and say, you should have left us. What, where they went, they didn't go to God. They didn't go in prayer. They didn't go anywhere. They came to Moses and said, you Moses, you should have left us in Egypt. We told you, let us die. Amen. I'm almost like the point of saying like, let this go. Good Lord. Is it? I mean, Moses didn't ever listen. Moses didn't ever say to them, I didn't tell you to follow. I told you what the Lord said. You followed out of your own. If you want to go back, go back. Would that be a nice view? But Moses said to them, he says, the enemy that you see today, you will see now. I'm here to say to you, in the middle of this, remember in the middle of the complaining, if you would stop complaining, you will see the hand of the Lord. When, they, when Moses silenced the people, the sea fire. They crossed over on dry land. Although the enemy was still pursuing them, they kept on crossing. I want you to understand, God always keeps your enemy at your back. You see, the problem with us is many of us are walking backwards. We're still looking at the enemy. And we're trying to move forward. But we can't. But if you keep on moving forward, the enemy is behind you. Yeah. That the Bible says, my spirit will go before me. And his spirit will be your rear guard. You don't have to worry about what's coming behind you. 
because it's in the past. It's behind you. And the Lord said that with the enemy you see today, you will see no more. Because as they turn their back, it was a spiritual picture of God saying, I'm moving you forward, and the enemy has no hold over you. This is important. When you stop complaining, you can see the miraculous take place. When you stop complaining, you will see the hand of God take place in your life. Amen? They seize the hand of God. But then they come again in Exodus 15. The people get the water to drink and they complain that the water is covered. In the journey of life, you're going to be faced with many things. And one of the things you're going to be faced with is the wilderness brought a change of diet to them. That means they're going to get water from the rock. They're going to get manna from heaven. A kind of diet that they were never used to. So they complain because it is not what they are used to. Now, for everyone that uh, you know, finds themselves to be diagnosed as being diabetic, you, uh, the, the first hardest thing for you is leaving all the sugary stuff. Is it? I mean, you feel for it. You feel for the chocolate. You feel for the cool room. It's, it's, it's like the Coke Zero is like zero, you know. It's, 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 everything is not, not right. It doesn't taste right. I mean, I, you, you try to eat any of those sugar free biscuits. I mean, they, it's like they're fooling you, you know. You, you feel it. Every now and again, you feel, you feel like, and you go and sneak a little chocolate. And you sneak a little chip. I am yeah, the yeah, yeah. Right? I'm not the only one that does that, right? But the reality is that when you're not supposed to do, that's the thing that you want to do. And the hardest thing is to change your diet. I mean, whenever they keep on trying to be on top of me and say, don't do this, don't do this, don't eat this, don't eat that, that's the time I feel like now I want to eat this. I want to eat this thing, I want to enjoy it. And it's not because you feel like you, it's, it's like sometimes you're feeling like you shouldn't tell me I shouldn't do it. But in the same thing, when the children of Israel, they came to the, they came to the river, they wanted water to drink, they wanted to drink, but they complained. The whole leadership of Moses was about dealing with a complaining people and God keep on trying to satisfy. What is the challenge of you? When you keep on complaining, you can't keep moving. You can't keep going. If you're dealing with a complaining people all the time, all you have to do is go into maintenance mode. And when they're waiting for the next time, something comes up. If we're a church that is keep on complaining, or you're a believer that keeps on complaining, you're not growing. You're not moving. All you keep on doing is you keep on seeing the negative and nothing else will begin to please you. Even when it begin, even when the waters that were bitter become sweet, they don't come and say thank you, they don't come and say nothing, they just drink. Have you known people like that? Even the thing that they were complaining about when it is fixed. They don't come and say thank you. They don't come and say, no, nice, good, everything. I appreciate nothing. They say, no. Oh. <laughs> and they carry on. Is it? That's That's the nature. Remember, these are people that have not matured. So they go from that. Then they, then they complain, we're hungry. So it gives them manna. Amen? That means this is when your spiritual growth produces a greater hunger. That means that sometimes that the, the food is not enough and, and, and they keep on complaining and they keep on complaining and the Lord says, I'll provide for you. But look at how the Lord provides for you. He says he provided for them daily. And on, on the sixth day, he provided two portions. But he said to them, take as much as you can eat. Now I can imagine 
that the first day he took more because they thought tomorrow in case in case God forgets in case God don't provide but what they found was what they didn't see yesterday becomes one What am I saying? Part of the, the, the prayer that the Lord taught his disciples, give us this day our daily bread. We should learn how to trust God for our daily bread. This is our daily spiritual food. And don't take more than what you're going to be able to consume. Because other than that, it becomes worse. What could have been sustenance for somebody else becomes waste in your house. Yeah. Amen. Because we were greedy. Because we never believed that God would provide for us tomorrow. And I'm here to say to you, God will provide for you every day. God will bless you with your daily bread. Amen. Whether it be physical, whether it be material, whether it be in the natural, but also your spiritual food. Every day you should be nourished by the Lord. Every day you should be learning something new. Every day you should be growing spiritually. Amen. That means God is blessing you. That means God said to them, I will give you the, the manna. And then they even complained about the manna eventually and God gave them meat. In, in Exodus 17, they complained again about water. At this time they were not near a water source, so the Lord called the water to come out of a rock. Amen. So God was keep on sustaining them. He, 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 amen. He kept on uh, keeping, watching over them. But then they came in Exodus chapter 32, verse 28. When the people started complaining and they said, Moses is in the mountain. We do not know what to worship. He is as something else. With all of the provisions of God, all of the, the direction and the spiritual direction was not sufficient enough. They needed something physically and tangible that they can work. We live in a world today where people like physical and tangible things. Today the, re the reality is why the church is open to deception by the enemy, by corruption of the enemy is because we like tangible things. If somebody can tell you there's something in your yard, someone took it for you in your house, we think this is hyper spiritual. Because we want something tangible. We want to be able to blame that this that is happening in our life because of this. And somebody will say, you know, that person there don't end up coming out. Now I believe sometimes some people carry negative spirits with them. And some people have evil intentions. And I know we have to be mindful about it. But I want you to understand, there's not a devil wearing every bush. We have to come to the place where we are mature enough to understand, have I walked out of the world of the world? Have I being disobedient to them. Have I harbored something in my heart? I was thinking about something the other day and, and, I, and, and I realized I, I realized something. So I, I said to Annie, I must not give people money. People take money. People take money for nothing. The heart is the price. Secondly, if they ever take money from me, Don't return it to the church. But the major thing that I've seen is the heart of the church. And I've done this on several occasions, whether it be ministry, chapters, whatever. And I found that when I do something for someone, and if the heart was never really put into it, it will something happen. And all of a sudden, I'm listening. And 
I know that they are certain people. Now, why, why do I say this? Because I understand there is a spiritual technology that means you cannot say you are with me. How about the years in secret that you have had this year? If I could know that, then I know that there are certain things that if you say you're with me and you're not with me, the Lord will expose you. I've learned how to walk into environments where I don't know anything, anybody, I know nothing. See the hand, how the voice of the Lord speaks. While we were in, in Kenya, in one of the, the areas I lived in, the one in Rita, is, is not comfortable always. Some places are comfortable, other places are not. People do their best to be comfortable. I can tell you how it is. And one place I was, and this area has not had rain for three and a half. So I got there on the Friday night and I said, Lord, in this community, the rural community, and I said, Lord, you know, I want to understand what your son is going to do. So I preached on that on that Friday night, great group of God people and I was excited. Saturday, the pastor was sending the celebration of the Lord too. But there was a whole lot of the community, leaders and people in the community. And after I finished preaching, God asked the Lord. Said, uh, would you pray for this? I said, Would you pray for this? No, no, I'm, I'm a form of government. I'm an obligation. And when you pray for rain in the place where there's a drought, people are measuring is this a man of God or not? I got there and I said, Lord, and I prayed a prayer that you. Every time I call you, I'm there to answer. So, Lord, now I'm standing with you. And how you like the powerful I'm not looking for the drought. I'm asking you, Lord, to call me. He prayed, prayed, led the whole community in prayer. Sunday morning, I'm getting to the tent. I remember the Safari community. I turned on to them and I said, think with me as you go to see whether the Lord speaks to your son that day. When I said it, I felt my son speak to me. The second time he got to see his son. We leave there on that, on that Monday, I leave that area. Tuesday, I'm in Nairobi, I'm preaching and the pastor. And as I start preaching, as I get up there, go to my son. I stopped and I started to pray. So that I was alive to I said, you need to understand where you are going to come from. I get back home, I flew back to the way back on the Wednesday, the Thursday, I get a message from the pastor in the church where I was. It says, on Tuesday, it's been raining continuously. It was already heard, you know, it was dry. Three and a half days of us. It's amazing how sometimes, even in the day of Moses, they didn't realize that the grace had not yet been fulfilled. Sometimes we have to acknowledge that the grace has been fulfilled. Not us. It's not me. It's the hand of God. But we've got to understand and acknowledge that it's not. And it's not something that was switched on at one season and stopped at another. It's something that is continuous. And that's why I say to you today, no more of rain. We've seen the hand of the Lord. We've seen the grace of the Lord. 
and, we, and I come like almost uh, like, like how Job came and says, can I only expect good from you? If I go through bad times, does it mean that God won't see it? Or God has forsaken me? I must understand that every season God is with you. In every season of your life, God will be consistent. His anointing doesn't shift into a certain situation. Come with me, God. Father, we love you. We honor you. We glorify you. We give you praise and glory and honor. For you are a faithful God. And nothing nothing will separate us from the love of God. And so today we declare the hand of the Lord over your people. That we find ourselves, O oh God, like, like Paul in whatsoever state we find ourselves, we, we purpose to be content. We pray today that we will not be a grumbling people, a murmuring people, but we will be a grateful people. We will not be a complaining people, but we will be a grateful people. Thank you that all that we have need of your hand has provided. Great is your faithfulness. So today, may our conversations shift. May our thinking shift. May we experience all of the fullness that you have for us. We bless your people today in the mighty name of Jesus. We declare, O oh God, that you are shifting and maturing us so that we can walk into all that you have in store for us. Thank you for the miracles. Thank you for the many times you showed up. Thank you for the ways you have manifested yourself in our life. Showing us that there is no lack. That there is no emptiness and there is no brokenness. Thank you that you are showing up in our life. So we give you the praise, the glory and the honor. In Jesus name. And everybody say it. Amen. Amen.